Welcome to Virtual Views, an online series that pairs themes of nature with works of art on view in the museum. My name is Glenn Tomlinson, and I'm the William Randolph Hearst Curator of Education. This edition features a close look at the biodiversity of the museum sculpture garden, as well as works of art related to the themes you'll hear about. We're joined today by master gardener, CJ McCartney, who will introduce us to some of the amazing biodiversity that we find in our garden. Thank you, Glenn. Welcome everyone to the Norton Museum of Art Sculpture Garden. I'm CJ McCartney. I'm a 10 year Master Gardener volunteer. And in that capacity, I've had some great opportunities to work with our community. I specialize in working with groups, civic groups, community groups, neighborhoods, um, native um, areas in teaching them how to be an informed steward of our wildlife and plants. And I do that in two ways. Actually helping people design specialty gardens as well as do community education in talking to groups, civic groups, and any just about anybody that'll listen. I'd like to teach them more about how, it, how to be a steward of our natural world. So let's get going, because that's the reason I'm here today, is to help us look closely at this garden and see what's going on. The Norton Stewardship of Endangered and Threatened Plants, which is another area that I help people do gardens in, is this Pineland Strongbark. Uh, critically imperiled is not a legal term like endangered and threatened. It means that the plant is on the brink of being listed as endangered or threatened. And this Pineland Strongbark is a beautiful pollinator for birds with its berries here, and it has nectar in its flowers for butterflies and insects. It's a wonderful addition to the garden here, and there's more of them. This is another really important plant here at the Norton Garden. It's extirpated in the wild, believed to be. And extirpated means that it no longer exists out in nature but only in cultivation. And by people cultivating it, we're basically saving the plant. Extinct means it doesn't exist anymore. And this is a mistletoe cactus. Again, very special plant here in the garden. And around the corner is some maidenhair fern, which is also critically imperiled in our natural areas. And again, the Norton is showing its commitment to the natural world. So now we're gonna look closely. See what's going on under all these leaves. There's a very thriving insect community. Caterpillars, bees, beetles. And when we look on top of the leaves, we'll see dragonflies and other animals that hover above. But first, let's look under. These are Kunti. The Kunti was almost eradicated and by the late 30s, the Itala butterfly was considered extinct. Why? Butterflies are very particular. Certain butterflies want certain plants to lay their eggs so that when they hatch, their caterpillars will eat the leaves of the plant. The plant is designed to be eaten, by, eaten down by the caterpillar. It's nature's pruning and the plant will always be a healthier plant when it has that sort of insect life on it that it's designed for. And this Kunti, by the 30s, was almost extinct. Not quite, because it was used for a food substance. And the Itala disappeared. No one saw it anymore. It was considered extinct for 50 years. And then a naturalist found a small colony of the Atala off Miami on a barrier island and he brought the Atalas home and started encouraging people to plant Kunti. And here at the Norton we have Kunti in five or six different locations because it's a host plant for this butterfly. All butterflies need three things to thrive. They need a host plant like the Kunti and there's other ones in this garden. They need nectar, 
plants that have blooms on them that will feed them and they need shelter which is layers and textures which is in abundance in this lush tropical garden. And the Kunti is one way that you can bring back a butterfly that is now thriving in South Florida that used to be extinct. So let's put all this together. This is a functional, intentional landscape. People with information and a lot of thoughtful actions created these lush tropical garden full of layers and textures and leaf sizes. Rooms that house sculpture and each sculpture has a different planning around it and a wildlife habitat that supports not only endangered and critically imperiled plants but also butterflies, insects, dragonflies, and just a whole host of wildlife. You know, when you get right down to it and put this together, this was a parking lot. And it's because of the Norton Museum of Art's vision and stewardship that it now is a very important place right in the heart of West Palm Beach that not only supports amazing sculpture beautiful lush foliage, but also wildlife and critically imperiled plants that were homeless and needed sheltering, and they found it here because of the Norton's vision. CJ introduced us to the idea of looking closely at the details of the garden and stepping back to see the entire space. Often looking at an artwork can be similar. We may glance at the entire work be drawn to look closely at a particular subject or detail within the work, and then pull back again to see how it all fits together. But another theme that she introduced are the fascinating lives of insects who animate this museum sculpture garden. Now, insects are fine out here. We try to keep them out of the galleries, except on those occasions when they appear in the artworks. Then they have a very interesting story to tell. On the third floor of the museum, among European portraits of nobles, devotional paintings, and mythological scenes, you'll also find a very convincing painting of a game hen and a kingfisher strung up and hanging on the wall. This is a game painting, a type of still life that became very popular among middle-class art patrons in the Netherlands during the 1600s. The artist, Jacobus Biltius, was skilled at creating paintings intended to trick our eyes. At first glance, into thinking that we're looking at what was, after all, a pretty common sight in a 17th century kitchen. As we look closely at the Biltius painting, we notice that the game hen and the kingfisher are joined by three flies, a beetle, and a spider, all casting realistic shadows as they climb the wall. The insect's minutely accurate depiction was due, in part, to the development of the microscope in the Netherlands during this time as well as a fascination with optical reality that's led to the great lenses we have today and the growing popular interest in science. Another Dutch artist of this era was Johannes Bronckhorst. The Norton possesses one of the artist's small watercolors of beetles. Though a baker by trade, Bronckhorst painted natural subjects on the side, many of which were later engraved and printed as images that became part of a growing body of scientific knowledge, categorizing and classifying the diversity of life. But turning back to the Biltius work, there's more going on here than scientific analysis. Remember that still life paintings often shared moralistic messages in symbolic terms with a very religious public. In Christian symbolism, the fly was associated with the brevity of life and the spider with death and decay. In this light, the insects in Biltius' painting are there to remind its original Dutch owners of our own short lifespans on Earth and the promise of salvation. Now, let's jump to the 20th century and visit two works by two modern American artists.
Italian-American artist Joseph Stella painted Tree of My Life. It's on loan to the Norton Museum through June of 2021 from Art Bridges. It was painted in 1919, just as Stella was gaining fame for his large works depicting New York's industrial monuments such as the Brooklyn Bridge. But while those subjects brought Stella great acclaim, he would focus on the natural world more and more in his subsequent art. In this work, we seem to enter a garden, and just like our visit with CJ, the animals and insects may not be apparent at first. As we look more closely, they begin to animate this large canvas. Unlike Biltius' realistic species, though, most of the butterflies we see in Stella's painting are inspired personal creations, in keeping with the colorful way that Stella described the evolution of his art. As he said, quote, Unexpectedly, a great clarity announced peace, proclaimed the luminous dawn of a new era. And one clear morning in April, I found myself in the midst of joyous singing and delicious scent, the singing and the scent of birds and flowers ready to celebrate the baptism of my new art. Stella is talking about transformation in the world, perhaps after World War I, and in his art. Perhaps his fanciful butterflies are intended to evoke the very metamorphosis that Stella recognized in his own creativity. But if Stella's garden is exultant, this coastal view by Yasuo Kuniyoshi appears bleak. Yasuo Kuniyoshi was a Japanese-American painter and photographer who came to the United States as a teenager in 1906 and through hard work and dedication built an important career as an American painter and photographer through the 1920s and 30s. His fusion of modern and American folk influences with his Japanese heritage made his art absolutely unique. With the bombing of Pearl Harbor, however, Kuniyoshi's career collapsed. And even though he was an outspoken critic of the Japanese government, his bank account was frozen, his camera was confiscated, and he was identified as an enemy alien. During the war, he painted several still life paintings, odd groupings of objects that evoke better times and that appear displaced and abandoned as we see in Rotting on the Shore, one of the paintings in this group. Two insects appear in the painting on opposite sides of the canvas. A dragonfly on a brown form at the lower right suggests to many viewers an ancient insect encased in amber. On the left side of the door frame is a praying mantis. These insects have traditional meanings in Japanese culture. The dragonfly suggests sturdiness, bravery, power, as well as joy and happiness. Meanwhile, the praying mantis is seen as graceful as well as contemplative and patient because of its ability to stay motionless until its prey is within reach. It could be that Kuniyoshi included these insects to suggest that not only his power, joy, and happiness were frozen in time, but that his only option was to remain patient through the war and the discrimination to which he was subjected. Thanks for joining us for Virtual Views. Please visit the Norton Museum of Art again soon to find your own favorite subjects in the garden and the galleries. Until then, thanks for joining us.